No, hi guys. Welcome back for the few of you stragglers still with me here as we head into chapter 16 of Peruvian Plunge where we finally say goodbye to Manu Wildlife Center. But we're going to start with this little excerpt from this excellent book by a fellow named Mike Tidwell. I know what he means. His book, Amazon Stranger, A Rainforest Chief Battles Big Oil, copyright 1996. <clears throat> but you see what the problem is here in Ecuador, said Carlos. It's oil. We're trying to protect the rainforest for you tourists to let it earn money without being destroyed. But oil is more valuable than tourism. Our country needs oil to pay its debts to your banks. Your country needs so much oil because everyone has two cars. So my question is, who is really destroying the rainforest? Ecuadorians or Americans? It was a fair and obvious question, and during the long discussion that followed, I did nothing to challenge Carlos's conclusions of where the real problem lay, when all the bizarre plots and subplots had played themselves out in the jungle, the final story was rather straightforward. Entire ecosystems were being obliterated in South America to keep highways and shopping malls full in Chicago. And next thing I knew, I was back in the jungle. Despite myself, I was obeying the voice. I was on my way back, back to the forest, back to the Indians, back to find the oil explorers, back to find Kurtz. But of course, by June 10th of 2009, I was trying to uh, get away from Kurtzita. <clears throat> As is so often the case, when you turn your life over to spirit, I had the order to do something i.e. leave Manu Wildlife Center and head downstream to Puerto Maldonado to await further instructions. But it was entirely unclear just how I was supposed to do that. The obvious answer and the one I had foolishly counted on was to continue downstream on some sort of cargo boat. Beer, banana, or lumber. I didn't know or really care. As is always the case when attempting to get from point A to point B in the Peruvian Amazon, particularly on insufficient funds, <clears throat> there was a small catch in my non-existent planning. My new home was tucked away in a remote side channel of the Rio Madre de Dios. Virtually all of the boat traffic heading downstream used the main river channel on the other side of the island almost a mile away. There were some regular boats heading to the airport upstream, $200 to Cusco one way, no credit cards accepted, but if you were traveling by boat upstream and got dumped off in Boca Manu, good luck. There was no way I could make it back to Cusco, the nearest ATM via that route. In short, I was screwed again. Better to be screwed with gourmet meals, real coffee, and hot showers in the Peruvian Amazon than to be in a tent eating grubs, I figured, so I settled into my routine to await the next message from Spirit. On Wednesday, ten days after Kurt Sita's promise to me that I could, in two days, move back to my beloved Boa, where, of course, I had been surreptitiously sleeping for the past week, the resident carpenters finally finished the four-hour screen repair job. 
victorious at last. I finally got to gather all my shit out of the well to well-appointed butthole and officially move back into the benignly neglected boa to enjoy my end-of-the-road privacy and jungle views while I waited out my siege. <clears throat> no sooner had I resettled into my routine life of Riley than that very afternoon as I sat riding in the lodge, Spirit whispered to me that a boat would be leaving from Puerto Maldonado the following Monday morning. The affable waiter, Marcos, needed to run home to his native Puerto Maldonado to tend to some tragic family matter. It seems his brother-in-law, a logger in the shrinking rainforest in southeast Peru, had been killed the previous week when a tree he was murdering fell on him on its way to the ground. Out of respect for the dead, both of them, I won't launch into a hand-bone rant about the karma of lumberjacks. You know how it would go anyway. Marcos needed to go help out his grief-stricken sister, nieces, and nephews, and the boat he was sailing out on, owned by a tour company that was taking two of the lodge's bird-watching guests to their next downstream destination, would be leaving at the crack of dawn on Monday. Perfect! Or so I thought. When I suggested that I might want to join him on the boat ride, the mild-mannered Marcos stared at me in utter panicked disbelief. It was as if I had just suggested that he and I should rob the Puerto Maldonado Bank, murdering all witnesses to our crime. Speaking of witnesses to capital offenses, the flustered waiter craned his neck wildly around in all directions to make sure the dreaded Kurtzita Ratcheta, or anyone else for that matter, had not eavesdropped on my blasphemous comment, thereby dragging him down with me into this guilt by association with the local gringo who had some an outlandish notion of hitchhiking on an eight-seat tourist boat carrying two tourists silencing me as if we were two soldiers stuck behind enemy lines, which, in fact, we were, Marcos led me to a table in the dark corner. Jesus does everything in this lunatic asylum, from bird books to bananas to boats, have to turn into a fucking drama? I wanted to scream. Samuel, es prohibido, es imposible. He fairly screamed himself in an excited sotto voce whisper. What's prohibido and imposibly about it, I snapped. There's a fucking boat going to fucking Puerto Maldonado on Monday morning with six fucking empty seats on it, and I am going to be on it, goddammit. Jesus, Marcos, what's your problem? At the verge of tears, Marcos buried his face in his hands and shook his head. Samuel, you just don't understand. The situation is muy complicado. You're damn straight I don't understand, Marcos. But before he could explain why the situation was so fucking complicado, like everything else in the Peruvian Amazon, Luis, the bartender, entered to start setting up shop for the evening's throng of thirsty tourists. With such a serious breach in security, the distraught Marco stopped speaking altogether. He grabbed my notebook and pen and started scribbling some desperate note to me in undecipherable Spanish. When Luis walked within eight feet of the table, Marcos quickly flipped the pages back so he couldn't read the hasty scribbles. Jesus, I thought, witnessing this surreal scene in front of me, this poor dude is so terrified of Kurtzita Ratcheta that he's afraid he'll lose his job if she finds out he let it slip about a lousy boat going to Puerto Maldonado. And he was probably right for all I knew. 
I promised him upside, down and sideways, that his secret was safe with me and headed up the Kapok tree to pray to Gaia to get me on that goddamn boat Monday morning. <clears throat> After dinner, I weaseled my way back into Kirk Sita's inner sanctum and fired off a short, polite email to the tour company that owned the boat asking permission to hop aboard. Not that I expected an answer, of course, as I wasn't a $150 per day paying guest. I used my short time on the computer as a pretext to tell Kurt Sita I had heard a rumor through an email that a boat might be leaving the lodge on Monday morning. If the rumor were true, I wanted to be on the boat. This statement was, of course, my de facto resignation from Mono Wildlife Center, which was exactly what Kurt Sita had been hoping to hear from me since the day I arrived. Not surprisingly, Kurt Sita gladly accepted my resignation with barely a question or comment. Also, not surprisingly, she agreed with Marcos that it was so fucking complicado to hitchhike on a boat with six empty seats that it was, in fact, prohibido and therefore impossible. Maybe, and maybe not, there would be a propane delivery from Puerto Maldonado oh, in about 10 days, and maybe, and maybe not, the captain would let me hitchhike back with him. I rolled my eyes at my former boss and silenced her bullshit with one of my own cut-the-crap hambone looks. Amazingly, she cut that line of crap, but she returned my own stare with an icy, narrow-aired glare of her own, letting me know in one look her utter contempt for me and my cheapskate ilk. <clears throat> Remember how hard it was for you to get in to Manu Wildlife Center, Samuel, she hissed at me. Well, you're getting ready to find out it's even harder to get out. Jesus, Nurse Ratchet is right. I gave my nemesis a crocodile smile of touche, meaning I'll be on that fucking boat Monday morning, no matter what your fat ass has to say about it and turned to leave. <clears throat> Samuel, Kurt uh, said almost, Kurt Sita said almost sweetly in her best nurse ratchet passive aggressive voice, I've been listening to the guys speaking English in your classes. I'm worried about Luis. Bartending is a pretty important job around here. I can't have a bartender who doesn't know how to talk to the guest. Don't you agree? How much bull in a china cabinet carnage can one guy reek in a week? I hightailed it out of the bitch's office to go beat some English into Luis's thick skull. Four days later, that would be Sunday, June 14, 2009, Kurt Sita and I were still duking it out in our silent standoff over the boat to Puerto Maldonado, scheduled to leave at dawn the next day. Sixteen hours before its scheduled departure, Kurt Sita tracked me down where I was riding in the lodge to deliver me the bad news. The following day, a herd of 44 ecoturisticos americani would be invading the lodge for a five-night stay. Every bed was claimed, so I would need to pack up all my shit from BOA and move to the staff housing for the week. Stemming the rage bubbling up from my spleen, I regarded Kurt Sita over the top of my reading glasses and leveled my most hardened, what we have here is a failure to communicate Hambone glances at her. Kurt Sita, I began in my most restrained tone, this bullshit has gone far enough. 
I have already resigned my job. I will only be in the way next week. I don't want to move in with the guys, and you don't want me living with the guys. And there is a boat with six empty seats on it pulling out of here tomorrow, and I am going to be on that boat. <clears throat> I could hear the power tripping wheels of her control freak brain spinning around behind her icy dark eyes as she considered how to respond to this direct challenge to her authority. I'll see what the guide has to say about that, she responded smugly. As chance would have it, that would not be hard to do because the guide and the two bird watchers were sitting two tables away from us at the very moment. She conferred with the guide for all of 30 seconds and the guide conferred with the bird watchers for all of 30 seconds. Kurt Sita strode back to my table with the 60 second verdict. He says, be on the dock tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock sharp she said matter-of-factly, and breezed out the door. End of four-day drama. Epilogue, when I finally did get the email from the tour company in Cusco after I was safely in Puerto Maldonado, it said, of course you can have a ride on the boat. No problem. The sweet taste of victory soured a bit when two hours later I clomped up the 144 stairs to the top of my friend the Kapok tree, possibly for the last time in my life. I climbed over the railing, settled my ass into the mossy saddle, and dangled my bare feet over the 11-story precipice. I fired up my last treetop bowl and puffed slowly, patiently waiting for the water pump from hell to peter out and die. I was flying high and the sun was sinking low when the motor sputtered out and surrendered the baton over to the cicadas and the frogs. I meditated alone with Gaia, just gazing out across the top of the darkening canopy below me, helplessly wishing that I could freeze time in this perfect moment as the final rays of the setting sun painted the magnificent crown of the strangler fig a soft burnished bronze. The final blush of soft light retreated silently from the highest branch and I lay back in the loving cradle of Mother Earth to sink into the crack between the worlds. When I reached back to cradle my head between my hands, my right hand grazed against the heart-shaped burl of bark sticking out above the moss. Absent-mindedly, I traced <clears throat> the outline of the heart running a fingertip lightly across the ancient tree's cracked dry skin. As I did so, the first silent tears started to flow just as the first stars began to blink on between the shadowy silhouettes of the branches above me. They weren't the desperate tears of despair and grief that had poured out of me before. Instead, they were that steady trickle of tears you cry when spirit first whispers to your, to your heart that a romance with someone you still love is dying on the vine and there is nothing either one of you can do to save it. You know, those kind of tears. <clears throat> Soon enough, that dripping faucet of tears ran dry and I pulled myself up to a sitting position. I reached down and lightly kissed the woody cracked heart goodbye, gazing southward Toward the twinkling eye of Sirius, I announce loudly and in, in a firm voice, Gaia, if there is anything I can ever do to repay you for this gift, you just let me know what it is. I am at your service. Blowing that promise out into the universe with a kiss, I turned around and clambered back over the rail. 
I was just about to take my first step down toward the forest floor when I was stopped dead in my tracks with the sudden shocking realization that I had never once offered up the ham bone canopy prayer that Gaia had taught me in a hot spring on the side of a volcano in Guatemala four months and two lifetimes ago. Better late than never. Standing, Kapok, tree straight, I faced eastward toward the Atlantic Ocean over Brazil and what tattered remains are left of that once seemingly endless vast ocean of treetops bringing my breath up from my root chakra that connected me to the floor of Mother Earth more than 100 feet beneath my feet, I blasted her loving her, I blasted her loving energy right out the top of my crown chakra, spreading my arms wide like the crown of branches that held me as I did. Turning south, facing into Sirius, I blasted Gaia's energy down the spine of the Andes all the way to Antarctica. Turning westward into the dull, hazy glow of what was left of sunset, I let go with my next blast of Gaia love, blowing it all the way across the Pacific Ocean to China, which holds the keys to this planet's future in her billions of hands. Next, it was time to turn northward toward the starry arch of the overturned Big Dipper, where I sent a blast of mother love to my own homeland, scattering it over the planet eaters, Obama, and above all, the people I love who just plain don't get it. Closing the circle, I sent one blast from the roots of the Cape Pock tree all the way out into the galaxy. Finally, as my swan song in the canopy, I breathed in the love from above through my crown chakra and shot it straight down through my root chakra all the way down to the center of Gaia herself. And with that, my time in the canopy was done. With one final salute to the sleeping spider monkeys, I shouldered my day pack and headed down the spiral staircase and back to the lodge. A downright joyful curtsy to Racheta, no doubt buoyed by the fact that she would soon be rid of the likes of me, joined Miranda and me for my farewell gourmet meal. Over dinner, Kurtzita pointed out a guide named Waldo, who I had never seen before. You need to talk to that man, Samuel. He knows a lot about that hunt oil you are always talking about. Little did I realize at that point what ramifications that last word of advice from Kurtzita would have on my life. By the time I caught up with the busy Waldo, my final class of students was already beginning to gather, so we only had a minute to introduce ourselves to each other. Learning I was heading to Puerto Maldonado, he scribbled out some names and addresses of folks I needed to talk to there. What we really need to do is get you inside the Amaracari Communal Reserve that the million acre federally protected slice of paradise where Hunt Oil Company plans to begin drilling soon, Waldo assured me, call me when you get back to Cusco, I've got people you need to meet. Then like a character straight out of the Celestine prophecy, he disappeared into the Peruvian night. Cusco? Whoever said I was going back to Cusco? <clears throat> For my farewell class, I invited each of my five students to write a sentence on the board in Spanish. I would translate it into English, and then each guy would read it aloud to practice the pronunciation. I got to choose the closing sentence. It said, Samuel is going to write a book about his adventures in Peru. 
and make a lot of money. As we were going around the table, our good mood was darkened by the appearance of Kurtzita Ratcheta, who had, thankfully, been boycotting class since the infamous banana caper. The last person to read the sentence was the hard-working but struggling Luis, who, unbeknownst to him, was fighting to keep his job. Okay, Luis, show Kurtzita what you're made of. Like the terrified young stutterer and one flew over the cuckoo's nest, Luis stammered and stumbled his way through the sentence under the glare of Kurtzita Ratcheta's scorn. It was a far from perfect, but more than adequate, approximation of the pronunciation of the words. All right, Luis, I crowed, and led the table in a round of applause. So, Kurtzita, what do you think of that? I think, snarled Kurtzita, that he read that sentence off a board. That's not nearly the same thing as saying it. That bitch. End of good mood. End of English classes. End of Manu Wildlife Center. And that wraps that up as we head back to the Mother of God in Chapter 17, coming right up.